mean-spirited crowd. Like now, I know a lot of you are on vacation out here, and you look for things to do. You come, you come see a television show, and you probably go to Disneyland or the Universal Tour. If you're ever out in Malibu, and you want to meet Jim and Tammy, they're out there now. It's a house with a sign that says, Do not disturb, just put your envelopes in the night deposit box. <laughs> How many of you watched Napoleon and Josephine on television? I guess it did pretty well. Uh, it was on another network. NBC saw it. It was such a big hit. They're going to do another historical drama, Caesar and Cleopatra, starring Pat Sajak and Vanna White. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to Tony Danza's Henry VIII. That's coming up on NBC. <laughs> now, if you saw the show, they had a disclaimer on the screen. What network carried it, anyway? Was it CBS, ABC? ABC. ABC. Did you see the disclaimer before they showed it? It says, parts of the show have been fictionalized. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> like they needed to tell us. Next, they'll put a disclaimer before we got it made, saying, parts of this show may be stupid. <laughs> anyway... This morning, I banged my finger hanging up my new Van Gogh. <laughs> did, you, did you see that incredible auction they had? I believe it was Christie's in London. They auctioned a painting. The last painting Van Gogh sold set a record. It was $39 million. They sold the Van Gogh last night for 53 point. Nine million dollars wow. for one painting. Now that's something you don't get on the Home Shopping Network. No. <laughs> I wanted to buy that so badly, I was going to hang it right there next to my dogs playing poker. <laughs> or, on the other side, my clowns on black velvet would have been just great. Does that boggle your mind? Did you know that when Van Gogh was alive, he only sold one painting? This is not a joke. For $30. And this was for 54 minutes. A poor guy. <laughs> he only got $38 for his ear. <laughs> he, he couldn't sell a painting. When he, he once painted a pussycat. And an art critic said, look, try flowers. <laughs> now this... This painting that sold last night was called Irises, and it was painted while he was in an insane asylum in 1889. Now, the reason they put him in the asylum uh, was right after he predicted that that painting someday would sell for $53 million. <laughs> it is almost obscene to say that the temperature was 82 degrees here today, while back in the east... In Washington, D.C., they had 15 inches of snow. <laughs> now, Supreme Court nominee Anthony Kennedy showed up at the White House with white flakes on his suit. <laughs> the FBI immediately rushed his coat to the lab. <laughs> I, I, even Kennedy now, they think, could be in trouble. Can you imagine that? The third... Why doesn't the White House just go to the fourth nominee? You know, it, it works for me. That's a lot of snow. The snow is so deep in Washington, D.C. <laughs> that the White House dog Rex was seen around the tip of the Washington Monument. <laughs> Now, uh, Ed Meese, the Attorney General, there's some calls back in Washington for his resignation. You know, Ed McMahon look-alike, Ed Meese, keep saying that. <laughs> Did you see the picture of Reagan hugging Ed Meese in the paper? You know, that's, that's bad news. Last people he hugged were Bork and Ginsburg. <laughs> what else happened? A little... This is probably something you didn't see or maybe you're not even interested in, but the protege of uh, Gorbachev, Boris Yetzlin, was fired yesterday. Yeah. Oh. 
Apparently, he found out the translation of Glasnost was Chernobyl Night Watchman. <laughs> we have an exciting show for you tonight. And later on, Jimmy Stewart will be out here and finish his, the story about uh, the twins he was telling last night. No, we have Miss Carl Reiner, one of the most talented people in the world. A lovely young actress by the name of Holly Robinson is with us this evening. A young comedian making his first appearance on this show, maybe his first network television appearance. I'm not sure. His name is Jeff Cesario. Jeff is with us. Stay where you are. Billboarded tonight's guest, I gave the name of one of our guests who was going to be tonight was uh, a young 10 year old girl by the name of Haley Nance. Uh, and uh, Haley apparently won a contest back in her hometown and she became the principal of her school for a day. Well, oh, she's eight years old actually. She's from Renton, Washington. And uh, she came out yesterday on the airplane, or I guess late last night or this morning. Apparently the trip was a little rough and she got sick and was in bed with the flu. Yeah. And can't, so, so not to disappoint all our friends, we're looking forward to seeing. We took this picture. This is for real. She looks sick, doesn't she? Look. She's in bed. Yeah. We put her up at the Sheridan Universal Hotel, and she's there with her little uh, teddy bear. So, uh, Haley, when you're feeling better, you can come back and, and guest on the show. Anyway, she's a cute little girl, isn't yeah. she? That's too bad. Fly all the way out here. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Now, last night on the show, I had a piece of comedy material. Right. I was going to do. And Eddie Shaughnessy, our drummer, had complained in an article that the band didn't get to play a number hole through. So I had the audience vote. I said, we have a wonderful piece of very funny comedy material, or the band can play a number all the way through. And I said, you decide. Now, I thought for some reason the material would get overwhelming a response. Right. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> they went with the band, so we let them play the number. Right. Uh, now, tonight, that left us with an extra piece of material, right? right? Mm -hmm. Plus, we have another piece of material that we had scheduled for tonight, and I have this dilemma. But if you're scratching, which one? one, to, what, which which one, one to do? So, you folks are here. You are guests in a way. So here's what we have. We have a piece of material which features uh, the marital troubles of, of Princess Di and Prince Charles. You've heard all that. A lot of rumors that their marriage is in trouble. So we did a kind of a graphic thing with pictures. <laughs> this piece. That's important. That's uh, important. This, this piece of material is with pictures. On the other hand. Being that tomorrow is Friday the 13th, we did some research on certain phobias. For example, a lot of people have a fear of the number 13, which is called triskaidekaphobia. You know, hotels do not have the 13th right. floor. Uh, people just they don't like that. Yeah. So, we'll leave it up to you. Now, of course, if we don't do the phobias today, they may be dated by, because we have something else for tomorrow, right? Right. So, by your applause, you can choose... And I'll ask you to applaud either the photographic piece with pictures. <laughs> I don't want to weight this in any way at all. No. Or the phobia. So I will say, I'll let you applaud and then we'll do the whichever right. one. All right. How many would like to see this brilliant piece of comedy material? <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, this superbly written... Very funny. Little resume of phobias. I think the first one. I, I, I think, I think the, the first, first one. one. Okay, folks. <laughs> you... You ask for it. Wasn't you're there a show, get it. Wasn't there a show called You Ask sure, For It on the air for years? Yes, yeah, sure. With Art Baker. Originally did it, and then a fellow by the name of Jack Smith took it over. Sure. And that's where people would write in. And I don't know where they ever wrote in, but you're supposed to believe that. And Art Baker would say, uh, Mrs. Warren Freeney of Biloxi, Mississippi, <laughs> wants to know, there was a man many years ago who used to catch a cannonball in his stomach. Yeah. I'd like to see that again. It'd bring some... Yeah. All of a sudden, some guy would show up and they'd shoot him with a cannonball <laughs> in his stomach. I think they made a lot of it up. But it was you asked for it. Anyway, uh, in the British press, 
they are calling it Dallas at the Palace. <laughs> True. The British press, when they get on your case, are vicious. Mm. If you think some of the tabloids here, you ought to go to England and watch a thing called, I think, The Sun and The Standard. They really do. Anyway, there's a lot of speculation heating up between the royal marriage, between the future king of England and the princess of Wales, Diane. And apparently they went 37 days recently without spending a single night together. Wow. <laughs> she was doing, you know, they were doing so. Apparently the problem is, <laughs> whatever, you know, they have official duties. Yeah, sure. But 37... <laughs> What the hell's funny about that? <laughs> or maybe she wasn't doing her official duty. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, that's all right. See, my mind doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of the people say that one of the problems is their age difference. Diana is 26. She likes shopping, going to rock concerts. Charles is 38. He likes putting on a kilt and doing fly fishing, I guess. <laughs> Now, th those, those people in England who support Charles say that Di is constantly compromising the dignity of their position. And those who support Di say Charles is a stick in the mud whose idea of fun is hiking in Scotland. Well, in pursuit of the real truth, we hired our own... You know, we have reciprocating photographers who live over there also <laughs> for The Tonight Show. Do only do work for The Tonight Show. <laughs> so we called our London photographer, Nigel Keyhole. <laughs> to snap some secret surveillance photos of Charles and Di. No one else has these. What? No one else has these. No. <laughs> you look at the photos and then you determine whether the marriage is in trouble. Watch the monitor. Now alone in his kitchen, a despondent Charles plays She Loves Me, She Loves Me Not with the caraway seeds in his rye bread. <laughs> you ask for this. <laughs> I was for the phobias myself. After a night on the town, Di, Di, Di lets cartoonist Gary Trudeau draw Doonesbury on her. Tragically, the next morning in the coffee shop, Di is injured when a businessman eating a donut flips through her to get to the sports section. You have nobody to blame but yourself. This will this will pick this will pick up. Charles tries to show Di he's macho by trying to make a McDLT from scratch. <laughs> Nobody could see that. That's a big cow or a bull or something there. Not too good. The money we spend. This, this one is this one's good. Uh, Charles helps make the lonely days go by painting the arches on McDonald's latest business venture, the McCemetery. <laughs> Charles tries to make Di jealous by showing up at a London disco with three of Henry VIII's wives. <laughs> well, same to you. <laughs> I'm going to the good ones. Di attend... Yeah, finally. I heard that snide, snotty remark. Di attends a rodeo sponsored by a British singles organization, Parents Without Princes. Here she is introducing herself to the jolly green archduke. <laughs> Charles arrives at Heathrow Airport and indicates how many British Airways stewardesses have shot him down. A jealous Charles has Di fitted for a chastity miniskirt. <laughs> With Di out of town, Charles escorts an old girlfriend to an innocent evening at the opera. But just in case things get out of hand, he wears a safe tuxedo. <laughs> Charles begins to suspect Di is playing around when he peeks under the royal bed and finds the Loch Ness Monster's Reebok. <laughs> Here we find Di in a strategy session with her divorce lawyer. <laughs> really, really going into the tubes, isn't it? <laughs> During a heated quarrel,
Charles grabs Di's hand and tries to suck the diamond out of her wedding ring. <laughs> and... <laughs> little Prince William indicates to the camera where he thinks his parents' marriage is headed. <laughs> there you have it, folks. In retrospect, how many of you have voted for the phobias? That's a, that's a challenge we face every night. Uh, we'll do this. Carl Reiner's here, Holly Robinson, and uh, Jeff Cesario, young comedian. Here we are. Okay. Uh, how many of you know? This is for you. Just to give... Just to give you a small sampling of what you missed. <laughs> Did you know a real phobia? Is, there is a phobia called Arachi Butryophobia. That's an actual phobia. It's the fear of peanut butter sticking to your mouth. <laughs> and those were the straight ones. The funny ones were dynamite. <laughs> and Maybe you tomorrow night. didn't ask for Maybe it. Maybe tomorrow night. Oh, no, no. We, i got to wait a whole year now. We can do that. <laughs> my, my first guest... Want to hear another one? <laughs> you know what gamma phobia is? It's a real one. Gamma, gamma phobia is a fear of marriage. <laughs> How did you get over there? <laughs> those, are, those are real. Now, here's one. I, I, I guess people could have this. Stasophobia. Stasophobia is a fear of standing up. <laughs> I'm not making these up. Just, now, now, just let me give you an idea of one of the funny ones to show you. Those were real ones. We had some others here. Nightline of a phobia was the fear that Muppet creator Jim Henson has his hand up Ted Koppel's back. <laughs> oh. Shame, shame. You would have gone out of here chuckling, but now you're going out with me. With visions of those dumb pictures dancing in your head. <laughs> My first guest is a good friend. He, he does everything well in the entertainment business. Uh, he's an actor, a comedian, director, producer, writer, uh, snappy dresser, all around. Nice guy. Uh, yes, yeah. nice guy. Would you welcome Mr. Carl Reiner? Possessed of the devil. I feel so good. <laughs> St. Vitus Dance. You know, I club. listened to that band. The last time I was out, that band inspired me. And you did a little dance the yes. last time you were here. And I was so happy. I didn't have a heart attack. <laughs> no, when you get to be my age, you lose certain faculties. You lose hair. You lose your ability to remember people's names. Uh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Uh, Mies, Mies. But that's a lot of movement. That's, yes. that's tough. So, I'm now at the point, by the way, I'm at the point in my life where it was, hey, a lot of things were going downhill. A lot of things. <laughs> the, I, the, the ability to dance for two and a half minutes without puffing. <laughs> uh, Would you like to take a break? Dom Dalloway does something hilarious in his act. Dom Dalloway does a dance, and then he, no, give me the microphone. And then he's, he stands... Off stage for a minute. After he finishes the dance, he goes. Gets <laughs> 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 it. But when, how's the, when's the last time you did anything? Like oh, that? 1973, when I was on your show and I showed how I did the aerobics Air Force exercise. I can't do those anymore. <laughs> anyway, but what I'm excited about. <laughs> 
<laughs> Is that no kidding? I am excited because theatrically, I didn't lose my creative force. No, no. I just, for the first time in many, many years, not since I wrote a novel and a play, which I wrote by myself, but I collaborated a lot yeah. with Steve Martin, George Guy, many writers. I just wrote a screenplay for the single, now, no offense intended here. Yes. The single most talented man I'd ever seen on a stage in my life on Broadway, a guy named Robert Lindsay, who won the, the, the Tony Award. See, that's wonderful. There's a... How many people have never heard of, ever heard of him? Ever heard of him? A lot of people have. Just a, okay. The excitement of this business is to do something new and exciting that keeps your blood going. And writing something for somebody who's going to be a new star. And you did this. And I did it. And I feel so good about that. That's why you came out That's dancing. why I came out dancing. I felt, you know how many years I've been doing your show? Many. 20 years. Uh, yeah, 20 almost years. as many as you've been here. Yeah. And do you... That I gave you that you that ties from the show. This is one of the things I once I told Johnny that he never gave me anything. I get presents from a lot of people. He never gave me anything, so he gave me his tie. And it's a beautiful tie. It stays in my closet. I don't want to get it dirty. I only wear it on special occasions. It fit with this suit. There it is, and I can't it says J C. Can you see that? Yeah, a little little J C. Is there a now that's years ago. Yes, and I can't tell people I knew Jesus Christ because <laughs> <laughs> it was a hand-me-down. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I tell him, and this I thank you. You, well, you don't want it back. No, no. No, I love it. Well, I'm flattered you would think of that and oh. bring it out of the closet. Oh, like, you're kidding. It's, um, it's one of my cherished possessions. Well, you're going to get another tie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just huh? ties and Can ties. I try that jacket on? Yeah. I love it. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I don't want to get it from you, but I, but I like it. I like the cut, and if, uh, I have long arms. No, I, you, I can buy, I, I'll buy this, not from you, but from wherever you bought it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little tight, but it's a beautiful fabric. Thank you. I, 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 thank I'm, you. I'm not, no, 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 I'm not taking, no, I'm, no, I just, I really, well, thank you. Very nice. that's, where do you get that? What? I have little weavers at home to sit there. <laughs> anyway, they sit in the basement and they just weave all day long. Beautiful. We'll do this, then we're coming back oh. and do a lot of things of which we're going to talk about during this day. Okay, one, one more phobia here. Another phobia here. <laughs> Eleganisophobia is the fear of whistling the bridge on the River Kwai in front of a Benihana chef. <laughs> do you have any phobias? Uh, Anything at all? No, I don't, really. really? And you don't know acrophobia? Oh, I have, no, I do have, a, of course. I have acrophobia. I yes, don't like fear it. Fear of heights. Heights, yes. I, I can do it, but I don't like it. Ah. I don't like it at all. And as a matter of fact, I went on a Ferris wheel once when my son, when Lucas was about two, because I didn't want him to have a phobia. He said, let's go on the road. And I said, yeah, let's go. And I'm up there talking a blue streak. Isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? And he kept looking at me like, why are you talking so much? You know, I really was frightened. You talk about getting older. Uh, now, you, you're directing and you're writing and so forth. Do you ever lose touch with today's generation? Oh, I, yeah, I think so. I think so. The music mainly yeah. proves it to me. Um, I, I remember, speaking of music, I was trying to think of it for the show. You on the old show of shows with Sid and Howie Morris came out and did a burlesque, a satire of what then was considered far out. The crew cuts? The, the three haircuts. The three haircuts. And you came out and all you had were kind of stand-up butch haircuts. Well, we haircuts. had real, you know, long hair, but much longer than anybody had at that time. But, but today, you see, if you nothing. did that today, you wouldn't even be close yes. to being weird. In the old days, when we were young, it was... Tommy Dorsey and his, and his orchestra, uh, Phil Spitalny and his old girl orchestra. Phil Spitalny. Phil Spitalny. But there were names like that. And today, I don't relate to the music because I don't hear the lyric. I don't understand the It's amazing how a kid is born today, and he can be three years old. He's listening to this rock music, and it's blaring through, and they, they know the lyric. Yeah. And I feel that must be a, a, an age gap. There must be something there. And the names, the group names today, you know, the... The Beastie Boys, the Fat Boys, the Oingo Boingos, the uh, Snot Puppies. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they name anything. The, the Cups, the Micro, the Who, the What, the Where, the When, the Which, the Why, the Doors, the Doorknobs, the, the Door Sills, the, the Eyelashes, the Ed McMahons, the Eyeglasses, the, the Ashtrays. Everything this seems to make no difference. No, it's a name of... Yeah. <laughs> the Man's Fly. I don't know. Here they are, the Zippers. I mean, <laughs> you're right. Could be anything. Uh, 
Now, everything is in the news has to do with the Supreme Court nominee. Yes. And uh, poor Bork didn't make it, and then Ginsburg came in because they said he'd smoked a little pot in the 60s. Is there anything in your past? Suppose you were up a Supreme Court nominee. <laughs> All of it. You put yourself in that position. You've got to go up, and the FBI is going to look into you from the day yeah, you were it. born. I wouldn't make it. And go through your school and what you've done and whether you've ever been drunk or whether you ever t took a, a hit on something. I Did you survive that? No, I wouldn't survive that. When I was about seven years old, I... I'm not asking for a confession. No, I'll confess right now. I stole a snake ring, one of those three snakes together, in the five and ten, a 15-cent ring. I did And I wore thing. it upside down so nobody could see that I, I had it. I stole a ring that from the Woolworths. Woolworths. The two of us, they've the been asking to be taken. Same thing, and I got, I got nailed, and I denied it. Oh. The guy came up, and I, it was one of those with gold paint on it, you know, oh, yeah. and I wanted it so badly. And the guy came up and said, did you take that ring? And I, I lied. I said, no. And he says, let's go see your father. Oh. And he started to march me out the door up to my father's office. It was about a block away, small town. And I panicked in the alley. And it was the first case, I think, of what, what do you call it, plea bargaining? <laughs> <laughs> I'm out there. No, don't tell him I'll do anything. Oh, yeah. That's horrible. God, it was awful. You know something? You would be a perfect candidate. You've been on the air for 25 years. Are you kidding? Wait a while. We know I'm all of waiting. you. You've been telling the truth you, about your marriages. Yeah. You'd be a very good candidate. First of all, the people trust you. You do the monologue at the beginning. You're a barometer of what's happening. You would be a wonderful, not a... a, a... Order, order in the court. Now, wait a second. Order in the court. I, I said this last time. Let this man talk. <laughs> I, I'm not for judge, because you, you have to go to some school. That was another crazy thing, how Judge Ginsburg was chosen. He had one year on the court. Uh, you would think that somebody would be a little better than that. I've know? been in court more than he has. <laughs> there. You see, right there. I got, I'm talking court experience. <laughs> Well, it, it, nobody, I think, really could survive that kind no, of... No, uh, not that kind of scrutiny. Boy, that's tough. No. That's really tough. We'll take a break. We're coming back. Okay, this is... This is, this is a good night for uh, a new comedian who's making his first appearance because you're, you're in a good mood, and that's always helpful to somebody who has not done this show before. Uh, Jeff is from uh, originally the state of Wisconsin, and he performs... <laughs> like a lot of the uh, young comedians, he performs frequently at the improvisation here in Hollywood, and uh, so would you welcome him, please? Jeff Cesario. Jeff Thank you very much. My name is Jeff Cesario. I am originally from Wisconsin. A couple other escapees here tonight. That's me. I've been out here four years in California. I've yet to go to the beach. Too many blonde people at the beach in California. I show up at a beach out here, people go, Who called a cab? Prefer my sports indoors. I watch sports on TV. My favorite is probably basketball on TV. I, just, I watch basketball on TV because I cannot believe the moves these guys make. I watch bowling on TV because I cannot believe there's prize money involved. <laughs> what could possibly be less strenuous and more boring than bowling on television? <laughs> golf. Okay, golf. <laughs> I'll confess, being from Wisconsin, I'll watch golf on TV, you know, just to see really good weather. <laughs> but who is riveted to their seat for a televised golf match? Who calls eight friends, gets a keg of beer? <laughs> Landscapers, maybe, huh? Some sports I cannot watch on TV. They're just too hard for me. Tennis is one of them. I, I, I like to play, but tennis is hard to watch. There's too many arguments in tennis. They're always arguing whether the ball is in or out. Why don't they just make the out-of-bounds out of Velcro? <laughs> I think out of everybody, I think the best athletes we have, probably horses. You ever seen a horse run a race live and in person? Beautiful animal. Although they have the best incentive to win a race. You're a horse, you win the Kentucky Derby, where do they send you? Stud farm. <laughs> I'm guessing most of us could shave a couple of seconds off a hundred yard dash time. <laughs> uh, 
It would have helped me in high school. <laughs> Olympian Carl Lewis in the lead. Wait a second. From nowhere, 14-year-old Jimmy Dugan. <laughs> That's the only real thing we have left on television. Sports. Everything else to me is completely out of control. But people will believe it if they see it on TV. This is amazing. There was a special on the other night on the Bermuda Triangle. And my friends believed it. People disappear without a trace in the Bermuda Triangle. And these people who disappear, you know where they are? Bermuda. <laughs> who always disappears? It's always some poor guy with six kids in college, a huge mortgage, and a dead-end job. Oh, he disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> We are losing touch with reality. I see things every day I cannot believe. I went shopping for a watch. I, I go to a jewelry store. The guy shows me a Rolex watch for $14,000. <laughs> I told him, as far as I'm concerned, if you got fourteen grand to blow on a watch, you can afford to be late, okay? <laughs> This I can't believe. I saw this. I cannot believe this product, we, that we need this. We have a new Ziploc plastic bag. You seen this? Where one side of the Ziploc is yellow, the other side's blue, so when you zip it together, you know it's sealed because it turns green. <laughs> oh, man, if you don't know a baggie's closed, you don't deserve to eat fresh food, okay? <laughs> you should be in the bag. You're the vegetable at that point. I'm amazed by what people eat. That's unbelievable to me, too. We have people who eat rhubarb in this country. <laughs> this is a weed. We're making pie out of it. People always say it tastes great if you add enough sugar. I got news for you. Anything tastes great if you add enough sugar. Leaves taste great if you add enough sugar. You just make leaf pie. Just rake and bake. We don't make that. But that's what people are eating, healthier and healthier. Junk foods are scrambling to try to find anything remotely healthy about their product that they can use in the advertising. It's hysterical. It's like, Hostess Twinkies, they're caffeine-free. <laughs> Great name for a food, though, Twinkie. That's the perfect food name. Look at that thing. There is nothing else you could call that thing. What could you possibly... Puff tube. No, nothing else. Cream-filled sponge rod. I don't know. You know, they grabbed it out of thin air, too. Bunch of guys at the end of the day at their wit's end sitting around a table. I don't know what the hell to call it. Ronnie, what does your wife call you? Dinky? Let's see. Dinky, dinky, double dinky, two dinkies. Twinkies. Boom, we're out of here. <laughs> I do love to eat, though. Eating is just... That's my favorite thing. I can't... I just... The worst meal I ever had, airplane. On an airplane. You ever eaten on an airplane? Oh. And on an airplane, they always put your silverware in this hermetically sealed, sanitized bag. <laughs> Meanwhile, your food's been sitting next to the John for an hour and a half. <laughs> <That's exhausting. laughs> I think my least favorite food that I can remember is probably uh, stems from when I was a kid. Whenever we would go get ice cream cones, <laughs> my mom would never let me buy that good tasting pointy sugar cone. I was the kid who always had to get that little snub nose wafer safety cone. You remember? <laughs> safety, my foot. You take a bite into the bottom of that thing, hit that cross beam girder system. And, uh, <laughs> other kids are enjoying a treat. I'm pulling cone shards out of the roof of my mouth. We will eat anything. We prove the food that proves it, potato skin. <laughs> There's no food nowadays. Five years ago we called them table scraps. <laughs> this is the equivalent of eating sausage casings. I <laughs> All I can figure out is it makes waiting tables a little easier for a waiter. <laughs> it's like, are you done with that, sir? Okay. There you go, sir. <laughs> Thank you.
I've said it before, it is always nice to see a new young comedian come out and do that well. Jeff Cesario is his name. He'll be back. Here's a, another uh, a young performer you may not be familiar with. Her name is Holly Robinson, and she is a young actress who co-stars in a police series called 21 Jump Street, which is on another network. I think it's on Fox, actually. Would you welcome Holly Robinson? Holly. <laughs> How are you? Very good. See, oh, listen, listen to the whistles. You. I'm so nervous, Johnny. Don't be nervous. No. Mr. Reiner here is very nice, and he's... If you've you... got legs like that, you should never That's be That's right. <laughs> All legs. You have very nice-looking legs. Well, thank you. The minis are back, right? And you know what? You what? look a lot better in person. <laughs> You're a whole lot better looking in person. You're kidding. Yes. Well, what do I... Well, no. you, look, you look very handsome on television, but, ah, you but just look a lot... Super handsome in person. Yes, it's close. A lot oh, that's very nice of you to say that. That's true. Have we met before? <laughs> No, I don't think we've met before, but, well, you might not remember me, but see, I lived in Malibu for about 12 years. Yeah. And on my way to Santa Monica High School, I used to drive on the PCH, Pacific Coast Highway, yeah. and you sometimes drove next to me, and uh -huh. I used to drag race you, only you didn't know it. Uh -huh. So, and I, I guess that's why I was It's kind won. of a fantasy, you mean? You were... Right. Well, well, not really. I mean, I was drag racing you. You'd yeah. glance over at me every so often, but you didn't yeah. know it was me, and I know, well, now we're meeting. Well, you're, you were very young then. Yes, I was young. I was living in Malibu and yeah. and uh, having a good time. Isn't you? Didn't your father work uh, work on some shows and still is working on? Them? My father was. I was the most popular four year old on the block because my father was Gordon on Sesame Street when I was younger. Ah, and, that's it. And so that you became an instant celebrity. Huh? Well, I was like an instant celebrity, and uh, you know we'd have you know you have office parties. We'd yeah. have you know Bob, Mr. Hooper, and and uh, Big Bird come over to the house for parties. It was great. It's got to be a wild weekend. It was great. And all the kids in the, and all the kids in the neighborhood would definitely. And they all come over, and I but I could never get on the show because my dad didn't want me to be in show business. And finally, after a lot of begging and pleading, he let me on the show. Had one line. I blew my one line. Yeah. It was Hi Gordon, and I didn't want to say that. I want to say Hi Daddy, so uh, I didn't. Right but now he's the producer of the well, Cosby Show. Yeah. Yeah. The show that's doing very poorly in the radio. Oh yeah, it's there. just terrible. <laughs> Bill is just struggling along. Yeah. yeah. Well, your dad really probably was trying to protect you because the entertainment business is, you know, you have to learn to take the rejection, and it could be very difficult and competitive. He's probably was just trying to. I suppose, but he was really embarrassing me. I mean, he's very embarrassing being. The only kid on the block who couldn't get on the show yet. My dad was Gordon on Sesame Street. Yeah. But uh, I had a great time. I had yeah. a great time. Now, what have you done besides 21 uh, Jump Street? Well, 21 Jump Street. Other than that, I, I've been known as an anthem singer these days. I've been think, singing the national anthem. I sang Did Dider Stadium twice. That's the riskiest thing in the world it's for an entertainer. It's a very hard song to sing. Yeah. And I did. I sang on the Capitol Steps, uh, the Bicentennial Celebration of the Constitution. Uh, which was kind of a scary thing because I sang with the U.S. Army Band and they played the song as a march like they had to go to the oh. bathroom and uh, <laughs> they said oh. by the time they started with the drum roll and by the time they got to the song I was just waiting for the intro and I got to the Can You See and I missed the Osei Oh, so, that's I'm a murderous that. song. <laughs> yeah. It's a murderous song. It really is very difficult. Robert Goulet will never live down the time he kind of botched it once uh, <laughs> did the wrong words. And who was but, the first entertainer who did it really with Almost did a soul version of it. Oh, Marvin Jose Feliciano. Feliciano. Yes. Feliciano. Went on, you know, everybody said it was very proper with it. And he went on, oh, say, Ooh. and started to do a number with it, and the place fell apart. Marvin Gaye did it also very right. well at a, at a fight. Yeah. But I get to make up for him doing it on Monday Night Football on Seattle versus the, with the Raiders, uh, November 30th. Yeah, now, have you, so, do, you re do you go in and rehearse? Uh? Yeah, you go in and rehearse. You better rehearse, or else you'll end up missing the Osei like I did in that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, say, if you miss the O.C., oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Now you got to catch up, right? That's right. That's and the right. band's taken off somewhere else. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So are you happy with your career? Things I'm are happy. Well? I, was, I, I, um, I got out to a bad start. I did a movie called... Um, <laughs> Howard the Duck. Oh, yes. That was... What it was called. But look, that happens. No, everybody. Howard was a great, you know, it was great working with the duck, and I had a wonderful time. <laughs> Feathers flying all over the set, and what can I say? But you got to have a few failures in life. Oh, that's know? for sure, but that was a big one. But I mean, I wasn't... <laughs> but nobody had, saw it, so no it doesn't make any it, right. difference. 
I worked Se on the Secret is safe. I worked on the film for three months, ended up in it for three minutes, and that's yeah. time when you like to land on the cutting room floor sometimes. Yeah. But I had I had a great time, and then I got 21 Jump Street, and it's been an up and up yeah. ever since. You single lady? Yes, I am single. Yeah. Well, kind of. Oof. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> you're well. Let's put it on. You're keeping company with yes, somebody, more right. or less. That's right. I'm not married. And See, that doesn't really say anything. It doesn't mean okay. you're going steady. It doesn't mean.